Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. This is our weekly event, and if you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. So just go there, click on this link, and you'll see all the events we have in our schedule. If this button is still red for you, click on this. You will subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you will see all the content we publish. So this is very important. This is uh, below the video, so go there and click on this button. And last but not least, we have an amazing Slack community where you can uh, hang out with other data enthusiasts. So the link is also there. Um, click on this and register and see you there. So during today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a link in the live chat, it's pinned. So click on this link and ask your question and I will be covering these questions during the interview. So this is the introduction. Now I need to open um, the questions I prepared. Wow, there are actually four questions already to you. That's uh, that's amazing. <laughs> but first we'll start with questions I prepared. I apo okay, apologize for fine. everyone. <laughs> 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 because I also spent a bit of time preparing them. It would be pity if I don't ask them. Okay, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and this week we'll talk about uh, developer advocacy engineering for open source projects. And we have a special guest today, Merve. Merve works as a developer advocacy engineer at Hugging Face. And it's actually not the first time Merve appears as our guest. Previously, she gave a talk about building a chatbot. I think it was one year ago. The work is, the, the talk is really good, so check it out. So yeah, and welcome back. Hello, uh, I'm really happy to talk to you every time you have like a really nice energy. I really love that. Uh, it's like a, usually like a chat rather than just uh, podcasting, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay, but since we're on the podcast, let's start with your background. <laughs> yeah, can you tell us about your career journey so far? So um, I studied industrial engineering and in industrial engineering, you have most of the, you know, like operations research type of um, stuff. It's like a mix of mathematics, statistics and coding, to be honest, uh, to optimize uh, workflows and everything. And over there, I have taken a data science class. I was previously doing forecasting already, uh, but I have taken a data science class and I was like, I'm going to do this as a job. And then I started uh, going to boot camps, um, doing open source projects. You know, I sometimes did Kaggling. I took online courses. I kind of improved myself. And uh, then when I found my first job as a, you know, like NLP engineer, I was doing chatbots and question answering uh, models. Like in both of my, um, Previous jobs, I was actually doing um, information retrieval and chatbots mainly. Um, yeah, like I was using Hugging Face back then and I was already contributing to Hugging Face um, as an open source contributor. So it's I was already a fan of the company and then uh, people like reached out to me saying, hey, would you like to work with us? And I was like super happy when that happened. So yeah. <laughs> And I did the master's and I also took part in, you know, the Google's and AWS's community giving workshops on, you know, predictive analytics, NLP and other things, you know, TensorFlow, SageMaker. So, yeah, um, so far, this is what I did, I would say. Mm -hmm. How did it, uh, how did you end up working on NLP stuff? So you were doing boot camps. Uh, uh, I don't know, Kaggle, but then eventually you started working on chatbots. Yeah, yeah. How, like how my, did this, was it I, accidental? So in my uh, in my boot camp, so basically I was going to a um, boot camp sponsored by Microsoft. And over there I was actually mentoring because like it was uh, half uh, theoretical and half practical. And I was like doing bo good in both. But I did a project about uh, some text classification and then I stick to it, did even more, you know, NLP projects. My first ever NLP project was actually at school. It was, uh, I was learning uh, the data science with R, like it's quite surprising to be honest. And Can you do I, NLP with R? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> it's quite unexpected, but there is even like a TensorFlow for R, you know, if you want to use that. Ah, and there is Keras, right? Keras for R. I yeah, I did. Um, so basically, we have scraped the data sets from Twitter on climate change, you know, people's opinions and everything. And we did sentiment analysis. We sort of did like a topic modeling at the first place, uh, looked at the embeddings and other stuff. Um, that's how I got into it, I would say. Like, it was really, um, like, I was like, this is super cool that you can uh, analyze a lot of people at one place. And that's how I started doing NLP. And one thing after another, like, I started doing it for a living. And, yeah. Uh, but I also did like, because I was always working on working in startups, I was doing everything. Um, like I was taking, taking the data or, you know, like getting it from APIs or scraping it, you know, I started from that to EDA and then building models and even deploying them, which is like very end to end, because that's what you do if you're a machine learning engineer working in a startup, because you do most of the things. I was also doing predictive analytics like churn or sales prediction. So yeah, like I was basically doing everything, but I did learn a lot of stuff. So I am not regretting that. And you said that uh, while working on NLP with chatbots, you contributed to open source. You contributed yeah, yeah. to Hacking Face, I guess also to other libraries. How did it happen to you? Like what was your first contribution? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, how I met Hugging Face was different. Uh, I saw, you know, like we have a chief scientist, uh, Thomas Wolf, and he has a video called uh, Future of NLP, which like for, uh, for two hours or something, he goes from the start of the NLP and through so many papers, he just analyzes uh, the, you know, state of the NLP and like, how, explains the papers themselves and I was like I mean this is so much work like what are they doing and then I learned Hugging Face and at my job I was I started using Hugging Face as well especially you know the birth model and everything and then I saw one day that Thomas Wolf tweeted that they are going to have a contribution sprint about data sets library and in datasets library, we will we actually have something called canonical datasets, which is like uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's like Glue or ImageNet. You know, you have to make them easy to use, and to do this, you need to write scripts on these datasets so that it's easily loadable and fed to models in a very native manner, rather than you know just taking a I don't know, CSV data set and just dealing with it in how like in like it learn a lot of right? And yeah, then you yeah. Have to yeah, yeah, okay. but the data sets are very complicated. Like for instance, there's something called the, mm. uh, you know, like we have attention masks in the data set. We have, I don't know, like in in um, for instance, segmentation data sets are like very complicated. So they need to be made uh, easy to use like for instance name identity recognition or question answering data sets they have like span indexes and other stuff so we were writing scripts to do that and i contributed to a couple of them and that's how i met my colleagues as well you know like the other day i i was talking to the to quantan who is like the lead of the data sets library and I was like I didn't even know like I would be working with you because you know I was bugging him back then a lot because I had zero idea about CI CD or I mean um, they were using circle CI for instance I have never used CI CD because I was already working in a very small company we did not have uh, any um, development processes that, you know, like help you uh, maintain the big code bases. It wasn't that big. So I learned, uh, you know, formatting everything from Hugging Face. So it was really nice actually. Uh, and then I attended their speech sprint where you fine tune uh, speech models with the language specific data sets. It was also fun. 
uh, and yeah, they were asking me to join and then, yeah, I joined. <laughs> it was also um, that in Google I.O. last year, I was talking about transfer learning and I included a um, hugging face in my slides. And, you know, I looked back and I said, you know, it, I was sort of like destined to work there or something. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, was it your first open source contribution? I guess no, you probably contributed to other libraries before, did you? You know, like issues and other stuff, not much, not like uh -huh. a so code without contributions. Code, not contributions, okay. Because so uh, uh, libraries like, you know, Hugging Face or Scikit-Learn have sprints in mm -hmm. which the maintainers are spending time to, for, to help you out in your contribution. Uh, because like we observed that first, once you onboard the contributor for the first time, it's easier for them to contribute later on. So um, it's actually a good thing to, you know, like have more open source contributors and help people out so that there is no scare uh, from contributing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine that it can be quite scary, quite daunting when you see like all these issues, all this code base, and you mentioned things like say CD test, code formatting, and then you yeah, just think, hey, this is too much for me. Like, I don't know how to start, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now I'm doing PR reviews and stuff, and it's like actually, you know, like a weird, uh, like a journey, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you e eventually become that person that is giving the review. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you remember when you actually were making these contributions, you already worked at a startup, right? Um, like, were you doing this as a part of your job or this is something like more like a side activity? No, it was more like a side activity. I don't mm -hmm. think the companies would actually do that unless they are a mm -hmm. very big fan of uh, Hugging Face or something. But let's say you work on something and you use uh, Hugging Face as a library, right? And then there is a feature a missing feature, right? Then it makes sense to kind of contribute to the library. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like for instance, we have our TensorFlow developers and I see them that sometimes they develop to uh, contribute to Keras or TensorFlow in order to, um, you know, ease the process and just optimize the some of the functions and workflows that aren't uh, really optimized over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you started, you contributed to this data sets uh, fun functionality of Hugging Face before joining and then they saw um, they saw you and they offered you a job, right? And well, what do you work on now? Is it something also you keep working on, this data sets part? I have a couple of, uh, couple of projects. Um, so basically uh, the reason why developer, like developer advocacy engineering is called engineering is because like it depends on the company how the, um, the job scopes and their technicality change uh, and in hugging face it's a very technical job to actually become a de um, developer ad de developer advocate so uh, we do not have like a community builder type of people but more like you know a horizontal engineer that is like supporting teams and everything and um, you know helping people out in general so and I wanted to become that person, sort of. Earlier, I was being uh, interviewed for machine learning engineering, but I was just onboarded for my previous job. So I couldn't do that. And then I was like um, approached for this. So I was approached twice. And I was like super happy because like I wanted to actually like have such position, sort of you know, technical, but also um, developing things for people to uh, have an easier journey in machine learning. So basically, I have a couple of projects. Um, one is um, there is something called Hugging Face Tasks. I'm going to write in the YouTube. So as a, as a previous machine learning engineer, I have observed that I've seen so many software engineers who wanted to build machine learning products, but didn't know where to start. And these tasks are actually like given the baseline information for a given tasks, like 
image segmentation or question answering. It's like it's sort of like I have gained so many know-hows in my previous jobs that I wanted to channel them so that people would have easier, you know, like a lower entrance level um, in starting doing machine learning products. Because basically in Hugging Face, uh, we have Hugging Face Hub where there are so many models that you can actually use directly without training a model yourself. Uh, so it's a bit um, developed in that manner. Um, this was my first project. And um, I have maintained uh, also the transformers, uh, but the TensorFlow side, because there is so many people using PyTorch in here. They do not have much, you know, TensorFlow people. Yeah. So I like, thought that Hagen Face uses exclusively PyTorch, so they don't like <laughs> TensorFlow at all. This is not true, right? So this is not true, I would say. But yeah, there is like a number of people who like PyTorch and FastAI are, are more than, you know, people who use TensorFlow and Scikit-learn, I would say. So they didn't have, like, they only had one TensorFlow maintainer, Matt. So like before we had more TensorFlow maintainers, I was helping Matt out, develop stuff and, you know, like debug things. I We now have more TensorFlow people and currently, so, I also integrated Keras into Hugging Face, in which um, when you uh, host a Keras model on the Hugging Face Hub, you can just uh, push your model with one line of code. It generates a model card for you about, it has like insights regarding to your model, your model's architecture, hyperparameters, anything for reproducibility basically. So it's Hugging Face Hub is sort of all about versioning your models and data sets and Like a model building. registry, right? Yeah, yeah, like a model registry. And like mostly, most of my job is actually working on Hub. So I developed uh, stuff for Keras uh, that would improve the reproducibility of the experiments, version the models. You can host your tester board inside the model repository. You can have model architecture, metrics, anything, history in the repository awesome. so that's yeah yeah it's good for collaboration with the teams because if you have your model on your local it's not much of a <laughs> it's hard mm -hmm. to collaborate with people so it's a bit like you know like a github or gitlab but for machine learning i would say yeah and that's why it's called hub as well right yeah, so yeah, yeah. Hub. like github hugging face hub yeah yeah, yeah. And uh, we also have something called Spaces, which is like uh, you can just build your demos uh, with Streamlit Gradio or just static and uh, just share with people. And recently we opened a feature called the Community Tab, which has uh, pull requests and discussions like you do on GitHub, but for model repositories or dataset or space repositories. Mm -hmm. And but here, yeah. Yeah, I just uh, I just wonder. So you probably covered the engineering part, right? So all you described, all these features, they are quite heavy on engineering. So you actually need to write code there. I don't know, maybe yeah, write yeah. tests, uh, you know, make sure like the ACI CD is working and all these things. But what about the first part, the developer advocacy part? Do you also yeah, do yeah. something like that? Yeah, we also do that. So basically, uh, like the last thing I'm working on currently is putting the tabular data modality on the hub, which is like, you know, improving uh, reproducibility and collaboration for the tabular data related workflows, having a better integration of scikit-learn and stuff. But it's also, so basically everyone in Hugging Face is sort of like a developer advocate. You will see Hugging Face course, for instance, Every engineer is in the course build, you know, like uh, producing content over there and uh, I don't know, um, shooting videos or like doing uh, doing uh, community sprints, like community events. So everyone is a bit of a developer advocate uh, mm, in that sense. And like my par part of my job is to, um, you know, like I help people out in the forum, you know, reproduce their errors and fix them. 
if you know like if there's an issue to be opened i better test everything to make sure you know it's good for developers and i usually try to understand the user journey in everything and uh, i stress test everything or develop something that would ease the developer's pain so it's usually about developer experience i would say and also i um I do, for instance, a sprint. It's called Keras Sprint, where we serialize the examples on the Keras's op official website, and we build demos over them, and uh, we we later contribute them to Keras, because like those examples are very minimal uh, for a good reason. Because um, I have talked to Francois Chollet, and like he doesn't want it to be like overwhelming. There are like rules to contribute examples and stuff so we put uh, models and the demos over there later on uh, to improve reproducibility over that because like it's it's not good to you know like you go to keras's website and um, you you have to run a whole collab in or in order to see what the model actually does so we actually do this for people and host those examples we did the same for pytorch as well. So we have community events like this, where we onboard people uh, to, you know, like contribute to open source as well. Mm -hmm. And That's I also pretty. do, I also do workshops on transformers, or, uh, you know, building spaces, it's more like a beginner level workshop. That's also, I would say an advocacy part of my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it like, would you say it's divided 50-50, like 50 on the advocacy part and 50 on the engineering part, or it's something else? So it depends. So basically, currently, we do not have uh, much people working on the tabular data modality. We only have Adrin, who is uh, who is uh, one of the core contributors of Scikit-Learn, and we hired one more person who is, uh, I don't know, like they have a famous package on again on Scikit-Learn. Um, because like it is lacking, I am currently coding stuff, I would say, uh, but it also depends on, you know, developer conferences and everything like, you know, I think around this year of the, you know, if this season of the year, there is more developer conferences. So I go and yeah, yeah, yeah. And like next, next month, I'm going to EPFL, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, to, present uh, today I'm going to Pi Data Paris. I have a couple scheduled. Um, so yeah, like it's, it depends, uh, but I would say I'm mostly like, I am like 60, 70% coding stuff and you know, like 30%, 40% presenting things or uh, I don't know, like doing community sprints in order to get more contributors. I'm spending time on the forum to, you know, like, or like GitHub issues to help people out as well, which is a part of advocacy, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess the main difference between a deaf advocate and a deaf advocate engineer is the engineering part, right? So maybe deaf yeah, advocates yeah. in the traditional sense of this role, they maybe spend less time on the actual features of yeah, yeah. the tool of the product and they spend more time educating or uh, helping community but here yeah, you yeah. Can, you're doing both right yeah yeah i'm i'm uh, so basically uh in some of the companies like it depends heavily on the company in some of the companies these developer advocates like some of them are focused mainly on doing community events or like mm -hmm. um i don't know uh doing podcasts or um, you know, educational material, I would say. Uh, but in some of the companies, they, this, like in Hugging Face, or I think in Google as well, we develop in, um, stuff inside and we test things. We do, you know, like I, um, I, I develop lately more, but like it's, it just depends. But I would say, the reason why we call it engineering was that previously it was actually called developer advocates, but we received uh, applications from people with lesser technical backgrounds. So not to steal their time, we have uh, turned it turned the title into 
engineering because uh, like we want to have like former ML engineers or yeah, mm -hmm. mostly former ML engineers that has been doing open source. And like the most important thing um, that we are looking for is already existing open source experience because um like that's the fundamental thing we do we for instance i do hiring sometimes for the team and the first thing i do is looking at the github profile of a person what's the best way to get this open source existing open source experience and you can join uh, the sprints of uh scikit learn or Hugging this is Face. How you, you got uh, this experience right yeah yeah exactly uh, you can pick like you you can pick a library and just go and uh, pick one of the good first issues and assign it to yourself and open a pr and you know it's the it's your first um, experience and what else let me think yeah i would say good first issues are a good one sprints are good and um yeah, like if you want to do code contributions, because we first look at the code contributions to make sure that person is actually technical. But a couple of other things that you can do uh, to, you know, actually contribute to open source is not code, but, you know, like documentation, you know, helping, uh, helping people out in Stack Overflow or forums, um, uh, writing blog posts or something like that, you know, or submitting bugs or issues. It's also a very valuable thing. And what else? You know, like even developing your own library that solves a problem is a thing. You know, I get these uh, ideas of libraries all the time, but I do not really have any time. Mm -hmm. Like I really like building tools in general. Like I was previously a person... <laughs> building models but like after i started you know developing more open source it's like uh, it's like a thing i just want to build tools i became sort of more like a software engineer i would say rather than a data scientist now but yeah mm -hmm. it's okay. it's fun yeah there are also things uh, like google summer of code yeah yeah and, uh, exactly similar... this is similar to sprints right uh, but yeah yeah it's it I guess it takes longer and usually in Google Summer of Code I tried to take part I wasn't accepted but I in general know a bit about the you process was, you, so you weren't accepted like when did you even apply <laughs> it was long ago and I think they just didn't have a lot of uh, places for Google Summer of Code uh, like the project I choose is the Apache Flink um, and I think they only, they, it was before they became an Apache project. And I think they had just one or two. Oh, okay. Uh, open Currently places. they have a yeah. lot. Yeah, right now they have a lot, of course, but it was before they became an Apache project. And uh, yeah, I just got unlucky. But uh, I remember the process is like, you need to write a, some sort of proposal, like what exactly you want to work on. And then if this proposal is selected, um, then you get a mentor and you actually work with this mentor. And um uh, you end up contributing like a relatively large feature. I was moving just... meanwhile, like meanwhile, the applications were open, so I couldn't really uh, apply that time. Mm -hmm. And I regret that maybe next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and right now it's open to everyone, not just students, which is even cooler, right? So back then I was a student. So I thought, okay, this is my last opportunity. I was graduating that year. It was my last opportunity to contribute. But now, yeah, you don't have to be a student to do that. That's uh, that's pretty cool. And you get some money for that as well. It's not like uh, insane amount of money. Maybe you can get, I don't know, a beer on that money, but not much, but still, especially if you're a student. That's, I, mean, uh, I, I do that's it for good. the glory, you know, like I do mm -hmm. at this point. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's, it's a good bonus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. And also uh, there is a thing called Hacktoberfest. I think maybe the first yeah. one was last year. You heard about this? Yeah, yeah, but I didn't really contribute uh, on Hacktoberfest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was uh, more, uh, how to say, global than uh, Google Summer of Code. It just, I think, a lot of like a big amount of uh, 
libraries tools took part there. So maybe this October, watch, watch out if you want to make open source contribution. I'm planning to contribute more to scikit-learn because like I met their core developers uh, there in here, like living in Paris. And they are doing sprints, but aside from sprints, I'm just planning to, you know, go pick some good first issues because like I looked at the code base and it was really nice and uh, to contribute to. And you can also learn a lot from the PR reviews that you get by means of the clean code, um, you know, sustainability of the code and everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a big journey, you know, like I really like uh, working in open source. Mm -hmm. And by the way, coming back to you, uh, you said you take part in hiring in the hiring process yeah, yeah. and when hiring you look at the contributions of this person at the code contributions yeah yeah do you look at contributions to some projects or contributions to yeah so it can be a person uh, a person's own project it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be uh, another code base but like if it solves a problem or something, it's, um, yeah, like it's a good thing. But like the thing is in here, we like, we have standardized, um, how can I say development processes? Like you develop something or like you contribute to something, you fix a bug and then you, you go through this whole PR review and, you know, merger and everything. So we expect sort of like a familiarity with, uh, developing something for a bigger code base, I would say. Yeah, it's not easy. Like, and sometimes the author, authors have their own vision. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like that are done in the, in some particular yeah, way. Yeah, I can say, I can definitely say that, you know, like in open source, you do not, there is no ground truth. There is like, um, like you will come across a lot of opinionated people about the code bases or I don't know, like even so many needs picking of your PR to a point of, you know, a lot of uh, comments, um, but you learn a lot. And at some point you get used to it and you understand the way they develop things, uh, especially if they start as a, like a really good, small group of people, like you will definitely, um, you might struggle at the first but like it's it, i don't think there is like a standard way of developing things that everyone would agree on so it's quite normal mm -hmm. yeah i remember contributing to xgboost to the java library cool. of xgboost yeah well it, way till the end so they actually didn't accept my uh, pr yeah okay so yeah maybe not so cool at that <laughs> and this is quite frustrating right so because they have their own way or expectations of the code, right? And if this code doesn't follow, I'm not talking about XGBoost maintainers in particular, but in general about open source libraries. So if the way maintainers imagine the feature is written, maybe they might just not accept the request, right? And this is frustrating. So uh, like it was actually my second contribution to XGBoost. My first was accepted and I was very enthusiastic, like, yay, now I do another one. And then my other one wasn't accepted. And I, okay, why am I doing this? No, I don't want to contribute to you anymore. So how how, how to deal with this kind of, um, you know, rejections? Because they suck, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Have containers have the best uh, motivation because this is where their projects and in the end, they will have to maintain it, not me, because I will commit something and then disappear, right? And then they will have to yeah, deal yeah. with this code, right? But uh, for me as a contributor, that was a bit demotivating. Maybe you have so, some suggestions. Yeah, yeah, of course. So basically two days ago, I had to reject someone's PR because, uh, so basically um, we save uh, TensorFlow models in a uh, format called saved model which basically has everything, like it has the graph, the variables. So you, it's uh, it's sort of like the agreed way of serializing models in scikit-learn, um, sorry, TensorFlow and Keras. And with this, you can use the production tools on TensorFlow extended ecosystem as well. So, and uh, some of the models that are very like in, in a, how can I say? In the early days of Keras, there are some serialization techniques in which, for instance, H5, you, right? yeah, HDF5, yeah, exactly. Some of the models cannot be saved in this format because like of old ways of Keras, like for instance, 
there is like models that are like CNN encoder and RNN decoder. And then you have like a sequential model and you serialize them together. Or you have like a gun model, like you do sequential and then inside the list, you put your generator and discriminator. For instance, you cannot save this with the saved model. So someone opened the PR to enable HDF5 saving. And like, I had to reject that because this is the agreed, like this is like a design decision we made to make these models easier for production. And uh, it is like a witchcraft to actually save those models like that it's not really encouraged. So um, the one thing I can say firstly, open a discussion in the uh, re repository or like organization to see the design decisions made and like why the developers couldn't fall, uh, fix that so far or you know like any experience or insight they have so you know actually there is a problem and uh, like communicating with the core developers is actually helping and I honestly um, do not have much um, advice to that. Also writing good unit tests to confirm that it works is a very big part of the work, to be honest. Like I test every single thing that I write uh, to make sure it's, it's working and it is compatible with the rest of the ecosystem because like um, those tests make sure that your code is like those tests are there to make sure that any new contribution will not break other functionalities as well. So I would say the unit tests are very good way of convincing the other person to, mm -hmm. you know, have your code there. And I think these are like two big advices. I don't know if I have like any other one. I think the, the point you made about the discussion is a pretty good one. And maybe you should, this is something that you should do even before contributing code like okay this is my idea i want to implement yeah, it this yeah way. exactly what do you think about this and then if you get a green light then you spend time implementing and then writing tests because i guess it can be pretty demotivating if you are rejected after the fact after you wrote the yeah code. yeah yeah exactly it's much less well not, not say not demotivating if this idea is rejected before you wrote the code, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like if that person actually discussed with us beforehand on, you know, why we do not save models this way, they wouldn't have to spend any time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, uh, but like we, most... we really like Excellent. people contributing. So we do not, we try to reject people in the least discouraging way. So mm -hmm. that's a good sign that, you know, developers actually care about the time you spent. And yeah, I think most of many tools, they have their own Slack or Discord communities or uh, also these discussions in GitHub, like a relatively new feature, or it can be even an, an issue in GitHub repo. Yeah, so yeah, okay. mostly in issues and discussions, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I think, um, so talking to open source authors, they usually recommend um, like first uh, going to their Discord and then chat there a little bit before starting to implement a feature. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and then uh, at the beginning, remember I told you that there are a lot of questions for you. I think now it's time to come back to these questions. Uh, sure. Sorry for keeping you waiting, uh, everyone. Uh, so yeah, the, the first question is, outside of Hugging Face, what's the best resource to learn about NLP? Not just theory, but also applications. Question. So. So most of the NLP is about solving tasks, uh, which is shaped according to your data. And uh, this can be question answering, like what you want to do, you need to determine that first and then pick the task that is uh, suitable for your use case. And like, it can be question answering, name identity recognition or part of speech tagging or anything. So, um, most of these are nowadays solved with fine tuning models, actually, uh, like tra through transfer learning, which is transformers, what is transformers are used for. So we, for instance, we have a 
course. I'm going to write it down in the chat. We have a hugging yeah, face. Please or... write not in chat because I think uh, YouTube uh, blocks all the links. So oh, okay, so write I'm going to, to... And yeah, then yeah. I will send it to you. Like it shouldn't okay. block my links. Yeah. Okay, I just I just uh, sent the link to you. And then I will now post to your live chat. It's a, it's a good good one to get started with NLP, I would say. Um, yeah, you can also, I don't know, like uh, check out the Keras examples. I really like them or PyTorch, uh, PyTorch's own examples and stuff if you want to learn about the practical side. For the theoretical side, I don't think there is much to learn. Like at the end of the day, it seriously is just a different form of data representation and uh, solving your problem according to that. So you just um, learn how to represent and process your data. And it's not even like the tabular side, to be honest. Like in NLP, what we do is we to tokenize the text, which means like you have a big paragraph and you or like a sentence and uh, you put them into pieces and just um, match those pieces to some numbers so that your computer can understand that it's just like pixel values, uh, how they are like uh, labeled between zero and 255. In NLP, we have like pieces of text and their numbers. So after that point, it's, it's more about, you know, how you represent your data. And um, that's pretty much it. Like most of the problems are solved very in a very similar way. So I would say you can take the Hugging Face course and look at the, for instance, in our GitHub, we have many code examples I'm going to send in Transformers. I think the question was also about outside of Hugging Face. Maybe the person who asked already knows about the Hugging Face course. Really honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so basically, the, how can I say? Um, I think Raza has a good uh, course, right? But Raza is for chatbots, like building for chatbots, chatbots yeah. in general, yeah. Like if you want to solve problems, it usually goes from transfer learning and uh, like, um, how can I say, there are a couple of libraries you can use to do that. Like Spacey is one of them. I think Spacey also has a course um, that they can uh, use. But like, again, most of the time, like I come to a realization that it's mostly about the data representation. I've, I've read so many uh, books about this. Like for instance, I read the NLTK book. Uh, mm -hmm. That is like the most famous NLP book I think to this date. And it was again, like mostly about the data representation and um, optimizing your neural network. And today we have um, like pre-trained models like BERT or GPT, and we just fine tune uh, them on uh, the downstream tasks like named entity recognition or sentiment analysis. And you usually get better results than just training from scratch, to be honest. So that's why I think someone needs to learn about uh, transfer learning in general, or maybe like if you're starting deep learning from scratch, just you know, there is like so many NLP with TensorFlow stuff. I'm going to send that. In Coursera, it is also another good course uh, taught by Lawrence. I'm sending you the link. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think at the beginning you mentioned, when answering this question, you mentioned that you need to first also ask yourself, what do you need to do? and pick the task suitable yeah, yeah. For, for what you want to do. And uh, do you have some ideas like what exactly, what could be like good projects? Like let's say I want to learn NLP and it's pretty abstract, yeah, yeah. Right? As, as abstract as it can get. So I just want to learn NLP. So what could be a good first project? Like should it be a, I don't know, named entity recognition or? I think the good first project is definitely sentiment analysis because um, the, Sentiment. Easiest representation of data is going through sentiment analysis. Like you have sentences and labels, and it's seriously like not much. In uh, named entity recognition, you have uh, the sentences, and inside there are like spans of text, and same with also like their labels, and same with question answering as well. Or for instance, um, 
plan meeting, like for instance, summarization or paraphrasing, these are also hard tasks most of the time. Because like in summarization, like there are different types. One is extractive summarization, in which you try to pick the important sentences from a big paragraph of, paragraph of text and representing that is also hard. So I would say sentiment analysis and anything that is like on sentence and the label is an easy way to get started with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, that's what I did as well. Like I have a couple of GitHub tutorials. I can send them. On so my... it's more like classification, right? So yeah, yeah. It's, it's about classification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a poetry classification notebook. Uh, that is like a tutorial sort of i'm going to send that yeah they are also on kaggle um i just sent that and there is not much to analyze about text as well to be honest like it's not like uh you know very big tabular data sets because like in text most of the time your features are universal it's not like very specific and the distributions are also not very specific to the data sets like the tabular ones so yeah like i sent you my uh, github project this was yes one of my, i already shared it yeah this was like the first tutorial i have written about the how can i say nlp and yeah okay yeah, thanks. Uh, the next question is, what is the best way for a newbie to get involved with an open source project? I think we mostly answered that. So we talked yeah, about yeah. sprints. We also talked about non-code, non-code contributions. We talked about Hacktoberfest. We talked about... Um, Google Summer uh, of Code and Google Good Code. First yeah. Issues, yeah. Is there anything we forgot to mention? Or we can just move on to the next one? Yeah, we can move on. Okay. What is the most important topic? Uh, what are the most important topics in NLP right now? Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, so lately, Hugging Face is just got really away from NLP, I would say. But it does vision, multimodal stuff, reinforcement learning. Uh, so I do not, I seriously like for, um, how can I say? I am not super up to date with it because like lately if you have noticed you know on the internet as well like most of the trending models are multi-model or generative models like DALI I don't know I read two good papers this year one was Flamingo uh, I'm going to write Flamingo. Flamingo by DeepMind yeah it was a great paper I'm going to send it it's also multiple it's like a multiple solving multiple tasks with one model and t0 model by hugging face uh, is also like a multitask model it's like a very big chatbot you can speak to i am sending you another link so i would say it's focusing on most generalization without further fine-tuning your model so we call it zero shots so I just want to speak to this model and let it answer me. Um, and this is like a very big trend. In Flamingo model, or there was also Google's Palm model. Uh, I'm going to send that as well. It's a very good model. It's like I read that, you know, like I'm usually not impressed by the models anymore, but I was really impressed by this. It was doing arithmetic you know, code completion. Um, I don't know. It, it explains jokes and stuff. And you do not... Jokes. Yeah, yeah. It's a very big model. It's like... And they benchmarked the skills of the model against uh, the number of parameters as well. So when you go to the website, you will see this tree. Like, for instance, in 540 billion parameters, it pretty much does it does everything. So I would say the latest trend is to um, just have like a very big model that can do anything, any task, uh, but these are obviously not released open source most of the time, like we do with Hugging Face. So currently we are training a model. I don't know if it ended. 
to be honest. Uh, we are training a very big model. I think it's released um, that has like a, a lot of parameters that I don't remember because that's what the big science team does. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a comprehensive answer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, as next question is, what is the difference between what you do as NLP ML engineer? This is what would an NLP data scientist do? Uh, to be honest, I don't think there is something called NLP data scientist. It's mostly, you know, like NLP ML engineer. I feel like, you know, I have this perception that data scientists are mostly people who are doing exploratory data analysis, visualization, and analytics. Meanwhile, ML engineers are like training models, optimizing the inference time or um, deploying them. Um, so it's the answer seriously depends on companies. Like if you are working in a very big company, then uh, your job becomes much, much scoped. But if you are uh, working in a startup, then you pretty much do everything. You're like, both of them, <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say. So it's it really depends. And I, I have never seen like a NLP data scientist add a job application add in general. So yeah. Yeah, I think at some point of this conversation, you mentioned that there is not so much exploratory data analysis happens in NLP. So yeah. it's most modeling, right? Yeah, yeah. And then they usually analyze the model, you know, the biases it has with specific mm -hmm. inputs about, you know, like genders, races and everything. So I would say it's mostly post-processing. Like mm -hmm. after you train the model, you do stress tests on the model to see if it's biased or not. So I would say the analysis is mostly after training the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what type of project would you recommend that new data scientists attempt when trying to catch the eye of employers for entry-level data science positions? Honestly, like uh, anything works, I would say. Um, and as seriously, long as you anything have a works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like most of the people don't even do that, so it's a plus if you do it. I think kaggling is like really helps. Like there is a lot of good stuff on Kaggle and like, um, I think the companies actually keep an open source thing or not and Kaggle, like everything is open over there. Another thing is, uh, at Hugging Face, we have something called spaces. I have told you about this, but basically in spaces, uh, we host your model demos made by Streamlit or Gradio. Uh, open to everyone, so it's. I use it. So I used to use it sort of like a personal portfolio of uh, of my models because I don't think that you know the technical recruiters actually go to your GitHub profile and run your models and try to make inference out of them. So it's actually good not. to have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually good to have like a UI of what your model does. Not just so, recruiters, like as a hiring manager, I wouldn't do this. This is just too much time. Like, yeah, yeah. first of all, I need to have the environment and this is already tricky, like already tricky. Like what if, uh, like yes. even if you have the requirements.txt file, right? It's not, uh, it doesn't mean it's easy. It's going to, to run, no way. <laughs> like I need to do git clone and I need to create a virtual environment then I need to install like everything and then I need to, I don't know, figure out how to run this thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's actually Even a good if thing. Instructions, right? It will take like 10 minutes of my time, yeah, which yeah. I might not have. But as you said, if it's already hosted, if there is UI, that's that's really great. Also, like if I were applying to a new job and if I would, you know, like if they would expect me to build something, I would definitely build the Streamlit or Gradio UI and just send them that instead where you can just run Python app.py and it just runs. But like having uh, an open hosting of these models with, you know, it literally takes one minute to upload those files and Hugging Face builds it for you. Or like you can also use other cloud providers and stuff. Extremely um, has some cloud, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, I think, very convenient. And, you know, like the recruiters go, hey, this person actually does what I am looking for, you know, uh, which is like already a proof of 
what you can do, I would say. Yeah, I remember. So uh, to Elix, as a part of our recruiting process, we have a home uh, home assignment, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, most of people just do what ask, please, I don't know, train a model, and then answer a couple of questions, right? Uh, very few people deploy this model, and only one person in uh, three and a half years that I've been working at Elix and take part in the hiding process, only one person deployed this as a stream lead application. And that person was hired because it was so nice to just. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. know. I don't know if there is correlation or causation. Probably, probably he wasn't hired just because of that. But it was so nice that, okay, here is the like when he sends the email, here is the zip archive, and here is a stream lead app that you can play with this. And the first thing I did was I just clicked on this, and then uh, so it was a. Like, I think, firstly, I mean. It, like as a machine learning engineer previously i hated to build flask applications for hours just to show it to the client for five minutes and not even take it to production i could have just done a streamlit good looking streamlit or graduate application and just to give them a link and secondly i am currently like for instance for my master's projects i was hosting them openly on hugging face spaces and people were incredibly impressed that i actually did that because TAs have hard time or like professors have really hard time trying to get your application up and running, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I do know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing streams on Twitch, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I gave up because like uh, the, how can I say? So basically, I recently moved to Paris and prior to that, um, in Turkey, my internet was extremely bad. And, you know, like I was, I even had the talk with Abhishek and I had to cancel it for once. And I said, this is the last thing I'm going to do because it is actually quite disappointing. So I think I'm going to get back because now I'm, I'm in Paris and my internet is actually stable. I will probably get back to doing podcasts with uh, awesome people because like I met really good people in here from I don't know, like scikit-learn, Dataiku, you know, like there's also people from big science in Hugging Face, so yeah. Did you bring your microphone with you? I'm going to go back to my hometown to bring it because it's too heavy, like it's, it's, uh -huh. it costs a lot. So at the, initially I thought, you know, I will bring my essential stuff and come back and, you know, take it. But I can just, you know, do it anywhere. So, you know, it should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, my next question was uh, about uh, the podcast, yeah, your yeah, podcast, podcast, influence podcast, but I guess uh, this is something you're not doing. At for a we'll while, to... yeah, for a while I, I gave up because of my internet again. I had to cancel episodes because of how the internet was incompetent. But now that I'm here, I'm planning to have them physically, actually. So, for instance, I might just visit Berlin and we can have like a physical, uh, you know, uh, podcast nice. session together. <laughs> uh, that would be nice. Okay, yeah. tell me when you go to Berlin. Um, okay, I think we should be wrapping up. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Do you, maybe is there anything you want to say before we finish? Uh, people can uh, like... It, for the last month, I was very busy, but like, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me through the Data Talks Club Slack directly or um, the uh, my Twitter account. I usually respond. So yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, there is uh, actually one question. Um, so why are you so bad at Mario Kart? It's like, it depends on the speed, like at 50 and 100 CC, I'm actually not that bad. But after 150 CC, I am really bad because it's like a, it's like a trip, you know, it's like a psychedelic trip to actually, you know, play it that fast. So basically in Hugging Face Office, people love Mario Kart and we are planning a tournament really soon. And they are like really good at this, like you cannot believe. So I am trying to just improve myself in the meanwhile and uh, yeah. So Hopefully. I guess that was a question from one of your colleagues. Uh, I don't know. I posted about how I'm bad at Mario Kart. So 
it can be that ah. or from my colleagues. <laughs> yeah, they bash me a lot. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, like, I actually didn't ask half of the questions I prepared, but maybe next time. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for finding time to answer our questions. That is always a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. See ya. Yeah, goodbye, everyone.